It's an absolute nightmare. Let's all go home. We cannot possibly work out what all this ridiculous nonsense means. Hello and welcome to Code Slicing. In this exciting episode in this series on processing state, we're going to take what we've done so far and build a more generic solution, allowing us to perform different types of processing on our state using a single configurable property wrapper. So if you have no idea what's going on, I recommend watching the first two episodes before continuing. And with that comes a word of warning. The content of this episode is not for the faint hearted. A decent understanding of protocols and generics is recommended before venturing forward. As always, if you find anything I say unclear or confusing, please let me know in the comments, making sure to hit the like button on the way down there, and I'll do my best to explain in a reply or a future video if warranted. Before we get into the meat of this episode, I want to congratulate Sean Woodward for being the first and only person to rise to the challenge and correctly answer the question I posed at the end of the last episode, which was, how can we simplify both the generics of backing state and the implementation of projected value? Starting with backing state, since it is defined within the debounce state struct, it has access to the generic types defined therein. So by leaving a generic parameter here, we are shadowing the value type associated with debounce state with one local to backing state. So we can remove that from both the declaration and the definition here. Much nicer. As far as the projected value goes, since we are using the current value in both the getter and the setter of our custom binding, we can instead just use the binding associated with the current value itself. To access this, we use the projected value of backing state, which is a state object, by using the dollar prefix version of the property, and then use dot current value to dynamically access the current value key path, which will return a binding to the property we're interested in. I go into more detail about that in that series of property wrappers that I think I've mentioned about 500 million times up to this point. So if you haven't watched it yet, um, you probably aren't going to, but do watch it if you haven't. I feel like I've got to say that. And then we just delete that bit. All right, brilliant. Now let's get into the rest of the episode. We're starting where we left off in part two. And as you can see, we've got our debounce state property wrapper working just the way we want it. Let's say that rather than debounce the state, we want to throttle it instead. One approach would be to create a throttled state property wrapper, just like we've done with the debounce state, and use that in place of debounce state. So let me just copy this, paste it here, name the copy throttled state, then we can go to the backing state and change this operator from debounce to throttle and add another argument to say we want the latest value. Let's rename debounced value to throttled value since that's what we're doing. And now we can use that instead of debounce state. We run it again. And we've got it throttling. But this seems like a whole lot of repeating ourselves in a world where don't repeat yourself is king. The only thing we actually changed was this line here. We can do better than this. As I mentioned in the intro, what we really want is to create a processed state property wrapper. So let's quickly rename this. And we want to offer different behavior depending on what we specify upon declaration. We want to be initializing our property wrapper with something that is going to take care of this line here. So that's where we're going to be focusing our attention. Okay, so this operator here operates on the publisher exposed by the projected value of the published property wrapper. And if we look at the documentation, that is of type published over the type value dot publisher. And the return type of the debounce operator is another publisher, which is going to derive its output and failure types from the publisher it's operating on. It achieves this by using self as the first generic parameter and assigning the type aliases for output and failure to those picked up from the original. That's fine and dandy, but this is a publisher specific to the debounce operation. If we're going to make this thing work for different kinds of operations, we have to be less specific. So instead, we're going to work on the basis that our operation will return a publisher with type any publisher, with a value type or value, and never as the error. And now that we know the types involved, 
we can write a protocol that's going to provide that behavior. Let's go up to the top of the file and declare a new protocol called state processor. I'm going to give it a type association of value, which is the type of the value going through the pipeline. Next, we need a function that's going to take care of the processing. For now, I'm going to call it apply, but we'll come back to that a bit later. Now we'll add the first argument, which is going to be unnamed, of type published over value dot publisher. And a return type of any publisher with the types value, comma, never. Now we can go to our processed state property wrapper and make the appropriate changes to support this new protocol. Since I don't want to be scattering generic parameters all over our initializers for both the property wrapper and our backing state, I'm going to add another generic parameter to the property wrapper itself and call it processor conforming to state processor. Now let's go from inside to outside working from backing state. Since this is going to work with all kinds of processors, we'll rename the debounced value to processed value. Then instead of debounce, which we can delete, we're going to say processor.apply, passing in the publisher of the current value. Then instead of delay, we're going to pass in our processor. So we'll call it processor of type processor. And since we've changed the initializer of backing state, we now need to modify the signatures of the property wrapper initializers and the implementations to account for this. I'll just copy this, paste it over these two, although I'm going to make these ones unnamed for clarity at the call site. Then I can delete one of these delays and rename these three delays to processor. That's looking good, but if we build at this point, you can see that the compiler is not very happy with us. Looking at the error, we can see that it's complaining about not being able to tie out the value type of the property wrapper with the value type of the state processor. So we need to stick a where clause on the property wrapper, ensuring that the type of value is the same as the value in the processor. Another build shows the clause have been retracted, at least somewhat. We still have the problem of the call site itself, but that's because we haven't addressed this yet. Before we continue, however, we have the option of making the generic nature of this property wrapper a bit simpler. You see, this where clause is matching up the types of our two generic parameters. We wouldn't need this if we only had one type to worry about, and we can achieve that by getting rid of value as a standalone type altogether. Then we can remove this where clause and replace value with processor.value. I'm going to go with this version, although this is going to be a personal preference thing. I like this version because I can explicitly see which type I'm referring to at any point throughout the code without having to refer to the where clause tying the two together. Another thing I want to tie up at this point is that I promised to revisit the name of the function that did the work. I don't like the fact that we've got a processor and that we're calling apply on it. It's more suggestive that we're doing work on the processor rather than the publisher being passed in. Fortunately, Swift Evolution Proposal 253 that was implemented in Swift 5.2 entitled Callable Values of User-Defined Nominal Types, which obviously means I can rename this function to call as function and then simply delete the explicit call, which I think reads better than the original. Again, that's just my opinion, and you may think an explicit call here better communicates intent. I'll leave a link to that Swift Evolution proposal in the description. So after all that, we've got a generic framework in place to do some serious processing on state. This is all well and good, but at this point, it's an empty husk of a framework since nothing conforms to state processor. Let's do something about that by recreating what we had before by implementing a debounce state processor. Let's go to the top of the file and underneath our protocol, let's add a struct. Private struct debounce state processor. Since we don't want to restrict it to just strings, rather than add a type alias to satisfy the type constraint of the protocol, I'm going to make this struct generic over value. So the type will be inferred at the point of usage. And not forgetting, of course, that it needs to conform to state processor. Building now allows me to use a fix to stick in the function stub for me because I'm lazy. There we go. And a debounce processor is also going to need a delay. Then in the implementation, I can call debounce on our publisher for delay in seconds 
running on a scheduler of runloop.main. Building now shows another problem in that the return type is not an any publisher which this function requires. That's why we now need to turn this publisher into an any publisher by calling erase to any publisher. And that's our debounce state processor done, so let's try it on for size. In our view, we've got a processed state complaining that we're not giving it a state processor to work with. And we can now initialize it with the debounce state processor with a delay of 0.3. And running that up shows us that it works just like before. Absolutely fantastic, but we can do better. Look at this. It's a bit messy, isn't it? First, I needed to know there even was a debounce state processor since there was no autocomplete. And secondly, it would be nice to adopt the same dot prefix style for static member lookups in generic context that was introduced in Swift 5.5 on the back of Swift Evolution 299. The same functionality, incidentally, that allows us to use dot rounded border rather than rounded border text field style in the text field style modifier, for example. So let's implement that. We've done most of the work to make it happen already. We've just got to add an extension to our state processor protocol. So let's go up here and say private extension state processor and add a static function called debounce, which is going to be generic over T. I'm using T rather than a descriptive type name here because I want to distinguish the generic type of the function from the named value type of the protocol. This is going to take a delay parameter, which is a double, and we'll put in the default here. The return type of this function is going to be our debounce state processor, which is going to take that T as a type parameter. Let's return one here, initialized with the delay. I could have used dot init here, but for me, I think it's clearer to be explicit in this case. I'm a bit on the fence about it, but dot init isn't descriptive at all. You have to look elsewhere to know what you're initializing. What do you think? Right, back in our code, let's use our new function rather than initializing our processor. And at this point, you might think we're done. But if we try to use it, you'll see that the compiler complains yet again. And what errors are we getting? It's an absolute nightmare. Let's all go home. We cannot possibly work out what all this ridiculous nonsense means. Do not panic. These three errors come down to the fact that the extension we've just put on state processor needs a where clause to limit the extension to when state processor is of type debounce state processor. I can click fix here to get started and going up to our extension, we can see that it's stuck self equals equals onto the extension. We can finish that off with debounce state processor, give it a type of any, and look, it's building, showing the compiler is happy once again. Let's all celebrate. Unfortunately, there's a problem. You see, when we filled in that where clause, it was a little bit of kabuki theater. It didn't really accomplish anything useful beyond making the compiler happy. It may shock you, but as long as the thing I'm putting here implements state processor, it doesn't even have to be the thing this function returns. In addition, the type parameter I'm passing here has no impact on the type parameter of my function, since I'm using t rather than value from the state processor. And that is by design, since I don't want to restrict the usage of this to a particular type of whatever I pass in here. What we're going to do instead is put the self constraint on the function call itself. So we can say we're going to be returning self, where self is a debounce state processor generic on t. And that's it. If at this point we did want to restrict the type of the value being processed, we would put that restriction on t. So we could say t is equatable. In this case, we don't need or want any restrictions, so let's remove that. And now if we run this version of our code, it's working properly now. Absolutely awesome. But finishing now would be a bit premature because now we've got our state processing framework in place, it would be a shame if we didn't take advantage of it by creating another state processor that did the throttling I was banging on about earlier. We'll duplicate this struct, rename it throttle state processor. We'll add another property for whether or not we're getting the latest values from the specified time interval and add that to the call here, which is going to be throttle with the latest argument on the end there. Now we can duplicate this debounce function, rename it to throttle, 
add a latest parameter which we can default to true, change the type of the state processor, and initialize it with the latest value as well. And with that, we've got another shiny new type of processing we can use by simply replacing debounce with throttle. Use a delay of 0.5, because why not? And there we have it. Running it one last time shows our input being throttled beautifully. Woo indeed. And on that beautiful crescendo, this episode has come to an end. I hope you liked that. If you did, let me know by smashing that like button and subscribe for more if you're interested. If you found anything confusing at all, don't be shy and let me know in the comments, even if you just want to say hello. But in the meantime, my excellent friends, thanks for joining me and I'll see you next time.